So quick journey on a bio on me and, and my journey. So I was Harvard College CS, class of 91. How many of you are undergrads, out of curiosity? A couple? Awesome. Front row. I love it. Well done. <laughs> That's terrific. Major? Yes. CS. Give her a hand. That's fantastic. That's really great. So I know some of you are taking CS uh, 50, right? Maxine, you said you were taking it. Um, some, of the, some of the HBS students are going over there. So I went through that whole very brutal process that you're in the middle of. Um, graduated, and instead of going to work for Microsoft, which was the popular thing for people to do in my CS year, this was 1991, pre-internet, I went and worked for BCG. So I did the two-year management consulting tour of duty. I learned PowerPoint. I got good at PowerPoint. Um, and then I came here for business school and I was class in 95. So I came into business school in 93 when the browser was first really being invented. And I got internet fever and uh, had the opportunity to go join a venture capital firm, a firm called Greylock, uh, but instead decided to join uh, one of their portfolio companies because I didn't want to be a VC, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So they introduced me to a couple companies and I joined one of them, a company called Open Market which was a really fun ride. I joined as a product manager, a very low position, uh, making $65,000 a year. I think I had the lowest starting salary of my entire class uh, at HBS that year. And, but I got a couple stock options, which was good because we went public a year after I joined. We had a peak market cap of $2.5 billion. We grew very fast, and I went from being a lowly product manager to being on the executive team and running products, marketing, biz dev, and professional services over the course of five years. So a really great learning experience for me. I left to then start uh, with a partner, a new business called You Promise, which was a college savings loyalty program, helping families save money for college, a big issue many of you are familiar with. Um, and I, again, had Greylock as one of my investors, as well as Kleiner Perkins, General Atlantic Partners, um, Charles River Ventures, a couple other firms. We raised a little over $100 million and built a pretty interesting business. Um, Sally May acquired the company, as mentioned, for about $300 million. Um, the company had this sort of asset management business, which was very valuable. We had about $30 billion of college savings assets under management. Um, about 10 years ago, uh, Two uh, friends of mine who had left their respective VC firms, one of them, Greylock, had started a new fund and invited me to join them to help found the firm, and that's what I did. I went over to the dark side, as I tell my friends, um, and helped start Flybridge Capital about 10 years ago. And a handful of my partners are former Greylock Boston team members, and then I'm the token former entrepreneur. Um, although after 10 years, I still feel kind of like a former entrepreneur, although now I'm pretty embedded as a venture capitalist after the last 10 years. Um, and we do early stage investing. We have offices in Boston and New York. Uh, the New York office we just opened this year. If anybody wants to talk to me about New York startup scene, I love that topic because we've just made a big investment there. We have half our investment professional staff now in New York and half in Boston. So big effort in, in New York. Uh, but we mostly invest up and down the East Coast. We do a little bit outside, um, uh, but we really focus outside of Silicon Valley by and large because there are so many great VCs in Silicon Valley and we want to be a great VC servicing entrepreneurs in Boston, New York, up and down the East Coast. So that's the short on us. Um, current fund is about 200 million, third fund. So we do seed and series A investing, software companies. Okay, so that's, that's the journey. So I came into the venture business um, as a former entrepreneur, believing that there was a lot of opaqueness in venture capital, that it was really a black box of mystery for me. And so about seven years ago, I started blogging about venture capital. I started a blog called Seeing Both Sides, Perspectives of a Former Entrepreneur, and um, got a lot of feedback, positive feedback on the blog, kept doing it, and then after a while, I decided to write a book. So I wrote a book about venture capital called Mastering the VC Game, uh, which I interviewed a dozen great entrepreneurs, a dozen great VCs. I interviewed folks like Jack Dorsey of uh, now Square and formerly Twitter, uh, Reid Hoffman of LinkedIn, Mark Pincus. In fact, my partners teased me if I'd only invested in those companies while I was interviewing those guys, I would have made a lot of money for them. Um, but uh, as well as some great VCs and just tried to capture a lot of the lessons about startup financing, how to raise capital, how to build a company, how to manage your board, all that. I'm not going to talk about any of those topics. 
So if you want to talk about those topics, we have a separate dialogue. I did a Skillshare class um, over the summer, and I did it last spring on raising capital. And I have some uh, slides on that on my SlideShare page, and I've got stuff on the book and the blog, whatever. If you want to talk about raising capital, that's, that's where you can go for that content. Um, I'm going to talk about Boston. When I, when I came to HBS in a faculty capacity, last year I started uh, with Tom Eisenman teaching this class, Launching Technology Ventures. Uh, one of the things I realized is that a lot of people come to school and don't know anything about the scene that they're immersed in. And so I wanted to give you sort of the hitchhiker's guide to the Boston startup scene so that you can access it and take advantage of it. Even if you plan to go somewhere else, overseas, New York, Silicon Valley, whatever, it's really important that you know what's here because it's incredible how many resources that you have at your fingertips that you can take advantage of. And the relationships that I built when I did my you know, hustle off-campus networking, my second year particularly here, are relationships that have led to define my career in entrepreneurship and venture capital. It's how I met the venture capital firm that helped me find my first startup. It's how I met my partners that now work with me. Um, it's just incredible what those early relationships can lead to. So if I have one message to give you about the Boston startup scene, is don't focus so much when I go through this about whether you would see yourself living here after you graduate. Think more about what resources and what people can you absorb, connect with, and derive value from before you leave here. Because in this two-year period or one-year period for some of you, you've got a great opportunity. So jump in. Every vibrant startup ecosystem has the following four elements. And these elements are in abundance in existence in three places in the US, in the Valley, in Boston, and, and more newly in New York. They have great intellectual capital, universities with great ideas where entrepreneurs and scientists are bubbling around, venture capital to fund those ideas, angels and accelerators and advisors to help bridge from lab to commercialization, and then what I'll call platform companies, successful companies that you can steal talent from or sell your business to or partner with. And if you have those four elements in an ecosystem, you have a really vibrant startup ecosystem. It's total magic when you have those four elements. And there are a lot of places around the world that are trying to pull those together in a synthetic fashion. This place, uh, within five square miles of where you are, has all of those elements. And it's a long history I won't get into, but people, do people know who the first venture capitalist was? Just give you a little history. Sweet, General Doria, very impressive. Who was a Harvard Business School professor, who's a French general in World War II, HBS professor in the 50s and 60s, beloved professor, who made the first venture capital investment in a little company called Digital Equipment Corporation, where $70,000 turned into tens and tens of millions of dollars. Um, so a nice tradition of HBS professor venture capitalists that I enjoy hearing about. Um, so I'm going to just touch on each of those four elements very quickly. So first, in terms of the intellectual capital, uh, if you haven't gone over to MIT, you, over the course of your tenure here, you're making a huge mistake. In fact, out of curiosity, how many of you are here from MIT? Just for fun. Okay, so it's awesome that you came over here. Um, slumming it. <laughs> and, and all of you need to show up over there. There is an EIR um, named Eric Paley, who is a, a good friend. I was teaching at a class here in 2003, and there was a case on my company, You Promise. And after class, he came up to me and he said, hey, I just met this professor at MIT who's working on some new technology, and I'm thinking about starting this company with him. What do you think? Eric just showed up at one of these entrepreneurship mixers, met this professor, it turned into a company, we funded that company, he sold it for $100 million, then he became a venture capitalist and an HBS EIR, uh, and he's you know, off, off into the races. So I really encourage you to go over to MIT. You too can find that magical HBS professor or one of these folks that's here in the room, uh, MIT professors, um, to help you with the technical foundation of that company. MIT is this incredible factory of innovation. Um, and then, of course, Harvard, everybody here knows this story. I don't need to 
tell you how great Harvard is, you voted with your wallets. There are a lot of other great schools on campus, and you hear a lot about entrepreneurial activity in other places on campus. Babson, for example, is you know, number one ranked entrepreneurial school all the time. What does that mean? It means if, if you're a student at Babson, you're always thinking about new companies. And I've seen a lot of great companies where HBS students, Harvard students team up with people from other universities. And I, again, encourage you to keep your radar open for the entrepreneurship clubs across campuses. Look for those startups. Look for the engineers. Northeastern University engineers are the best coders. Uh, WPI engineers are great coders. They don't ask for as much equity as the MIT engineers. So you know, really keep your radar up for great engineering talent around the, around the area. Uh, this state has a ton of inventors, a ton of patent issuance. Uh, you can see here per resident is just off the charts. NIH funding off the charts in this region. And it's very, very concentrated. I made the crack about five miles from here. Um, the innovation workforce in this state, it makes up in many of these places in this metro region, half the state, a third of the state. So unlike other economies which have five or six pistons, the Massachusetts economy has one big piston, the innovation piston. Yes, there's higher ed, yes, there are hospitals and healthcare, and there's some financial services, but the innovation economy is really the big driving force, which means that in the soccer fields, in the neighborhoods, in your apartment buildings, if you're off campus, you're likely to be with startup executives. There are three main clusters, and some say four clusters, if you divide Cambridge and Boston in half. So, the cluster in Cambridge is Kendall Square. Kendall Square is the densest square mile for startups in the world. There's one building in Cam Kendall Square called the um, CIC, the Cambridge Innovation Center. How many of you have been to the CIC? If you are not raising your hand, you are making a mistake. Okay, the CIC is like the hub of startups in this region. It's an awesome place, bubbling with startups. Um, and then there's just a ton of activity around Kendall Square. Across the river, there's the Boston Innovation District, a ton of startups. And then 128, uh, very active activity. And then 495 tends to be more of the datacom, networking, systems companies. Um, so you see a lot of hardcore uh, uh, folks out there. What's the big company out there, people know? Cisco has a lot, EMC. EMC, uh, $60 billion market cap company, one of the quietest leaders in the tech world is based out here in that 495 corridor, which means anything in cloud, storage, systems, security, a ton of talent out there. So just, I made the comment earlier, the statement, there are only three real hubs where the whole startup ecosystem works as a, a group with all those four elements, New York, Boston, California. You can see the numbers. California has far more venture capital dollars uh, this is 2011 figures in terms of how much investment in companies in that state, 14 billion, over 14 billion in California, nearly 3 billion in the state of Massachusetts, uh, just uh, uh, under 3 billion in New York. Uh, on a per capita basis, which is what matters if you're an entrepreneur, because it's not how much money is sloshing around, it's how much money is there for me, uh, it, it looks like this, where uh, Massachusetts has a lot of venture capital dollars relative to people, relative to companies, and so a lot of times what you see is companies coming out of Harvard or MIT, they'll have a local VC and then a Silicon Valley VC or a New York VC or sometimes two local VCs funding those companies through their whole cycle. So in this market, if you haven't reached out to a venture capitalist or a venture capital firm, if you haven't reached out to a super angel or gotten to know the angel community, that's a mistake, it's a missed opportunity. A Couple sectors that really matter in this region, life sciences, it's sort of universally viewed to be the top life sciences region. Almost every major pharma company has headquarters or big R&D shops here and a lot of the big biotech companies like Vertex and others which grew up here are now big companies. Vertex is, uh, since they got their cystic fibrosis FDA approval, they're now at a $10 billion market cap. Um, energy sector is very big here, Enernoc and A123, some battery companies, a lot of technology out of MIT in this space. I had a student in my HBS class last year in the, in the Launching Technology Ventures class that went over to MIT, found a battery startup, 
fell in love with it. They said, hey, you're an HBS student. Help us with the business plan. Help us um, with the contest and the 100K. He joined their team. He went through that whole process. He pitched a bunch of VCs around here and in the Valley, got great experience, and ended up deciding not to go with the startup, but instead took a job offer from Andreessen Horowitz to go join them as a post-MBA associate. So an interesting success story for a guy who you know, didn't necessarily want to start a company, joined an MIT team just to be helpful and be engaged, got a tremendous amount of learning through that startup process, and then parlay that into a spectacular job opportunity. So again, get over there, get engaged, get exposed. Um, then there are a bunch of really interesting micro clusters here that have strength. And I throw some company names up there so that you all can think about if you're interested in these areas, then you should go seek out these companies. Um, we've had five nine-figure exits, so greater than $100 million exits in the mobile space. Those are the five companies and their acquirers. And then we've had seven uh, really interesting venture-backed mobile companies floating around, Skyhook and Saving Star, and JumpTap, Session M, real leaders in mobile advertising, mobile commerce. Almost all of these companies and all the companies I flash in front of you, they will take summer interns. They will take field study projects. Uh, so if you're thinking about doing field study projects, they're called ISFs, have that right? Independent study, IPs, thank you. In IPs, um, go find one of these companies that's local because if you do it with a local company, you'll get FaceTime with the CEO, you'll meet the chief technology officer, you'll just meet and get exposure to a higher quality executive and more exposure uh, by having it be local. So an option to think about. And then a bunch of other micro clusters, cloud computing, gaming, video very strong with the recent IPO of Brightcove, the e-commerce space quite strong, marketing tech, Robotics is a real hot spot here. Um, so again, some great clusters. If you're interested in getting exposure to any of these areas, find a company that's local, get exposed, get engaged. One of the things that's also really great about being here as a student is you get access to the New York City startup community. There's a trek going on in January. How many of you have signed up for it? A handful of you? Great. Um, if you're not on that trek and you're interested in the areas that are really strong in New York, like media, ad tech, wireless, financial services, then I highly recommend get a couple weekends, grab some friends, go to New York, go visit Foursquare, go visit Etsy, go visit some hot companies down there, and get exposed to that ecosystem. You can access it very easily from here, and the relationships between HBS, Harvard in general, and New York are really quite strong. The alumni community is unbelievable. If you think about the last five years, Rent the Runway, Birchbox, Bobble Bar, Take the Interview, all of these companies were started by recent HBS grads. The other thing similar about those companies, anybody? All started by women, thank you. Excellent, you guys, great class. Thank you, I always love Maxine's answers. All started by women, um, and for whatever reason I can't tell you what, but there is some magnetic power to New York for HBS women that is causing a lot of great startup leadership out of that community. So, uh, and, and, that, and those women who we bring on campus all the time, we had a dinner last year for people interested in the New York startup scene with the Bobble Bar women. There's a class, we did in my class, a case on Rent the Runway. Um, they're always connecting and serving as mentors to folks interested in the market. Um, the other thing, I always think if you keep an eye on who's going public, those are the companies that you want to find ways to attach to because you can get, you can see that those are the companies with momentum that raise a lot of capital and may have capacity to bring on board people like you, either as interns or full time. So these are the companies, there are 12 in the last 18 months that have gone public in Boston. You see them on the left, Kayak, Demandware, TripAdvisor being the most valuable at close to $5 billion in market cap. Um, and then a handful of M&As above 500 million. Again, that means those are companies where there's been big investment, there's scale, you can walk in, learn product management, learn business development, learn sales, and get exposed to some really interesting companies and market leaders. Uh, 
every major tech company has a big presence here. You mentioned Cisco out in 495, and Amazon's now got a presence. Disney built a presence. It's another fun thing. If you're into the whole Disney Imagineering um, you know, kind of world, you can find, attach yourself to the, to the lab that's here. Uh, you know, if any of these companies are doing things in product areas that are interesting to you, you can access them at T right away. And then I think the richest uh, new thing in this community are the startup resources that are available to young entrepreneurs. If I did this slide five years ago, I'd have three logos on the chart. Um, now I had to just cut things down to squeeze them in. So just to grab a few, Stay in MA is a program that we started that gives small scholarships to students who want to attend local networking conferences. I observed that students didn't go to local events because the $50 fee or $100 fee was a point of friction. And what we did is we said, fine, let's just have free mini scholarships for students who want to go to these events. So if you want to go to a conference off campus in an area that's of interest to you, go to Stay in MA, apply, you get a $100 scholarship to attend a wireless conference or a, a social marketing conference. Um, Techstars. In CIC, uh, there are, as I said, hundreds of startups. Right next door is Techstars, which is the contest that is in New York and Colorado and Seattle that is where a dozen startups are in a class each year. Fantastic companies that are there, always looking for HBS students, always looking for projects and interns. Definitely worth checking out. The other sort of incubator environment that you should look at is Mass, Chall uh, Mass Challenge, which is having their event, I think it's like in two weeks. Who can help me? 24th, maybe? Do people know? <coughs> Anyone? Mass Challenge? Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Um, it's, a, it's a terrific event where the Boston startup community gathers to celebrate the 20 finalists from this contest. It's a million dollar contest, thousands of applicants. They select 100, then they go through a finalist regime, and then they elect winners who get the prize money. Um, it's a wonderful event. You should definitely think about checking that out. The other big events coming up, people interested in marketing and social media and e-commerce, there's an event called Future M, which is happening next week as well. Um, Future M is a three-day long conference where marketing executives and ad agencies talk about the future of marketing and technology. Also a great program. The, the meta point is there are a ton of events going on in whatever area that you're in, whatever vertical that you're interested in, you can find an event, you can find an interest group, you can get exposed to some great companies. Um, a handful of local folks to follow. By the way, this uh, slide deck is on slideshare.net slash busgang. I should have mentioned that earlier. And I tweeted it out this afternoon before I came over. So if you want to look at my Twitter handle, at busgang, is my Twitter handle. You can find the um, full slide, so it's up, up on the slide share. So a bunch of um, folks I wanted to highlight as great investors and entrepreneurs to follow if you want to be a part of the local milieu. I think one of the things that the Startup Tribe group last year did really well, Andrew and Jess and Dan, for people who were friendly with them, is that they plugged into this community. And a lot of how they did it was on Twitter. A lot of how they did it was through blogging and social media. And some of how they did it is by showing up at various events. And so I really uh, encourage this year's leaders to have that, continue that tradition. And then I don't know if you all know all the resources going on at Harvard right now, but this is crazy what's happened in the last few years. So I mentioned CS50. There's a group of undergrads who have created a tech mobile engineering group out of the Harvard student agencies called Rover, headed up by a guy named Scott Crouch. And it's a bunch of engineers who are doing projects in mobile, typically. So if you have a startup and you want to get access to engineering resources, they're right across the river. Hack Harvard is another spectacular place to find engineers and technical talent over there. And that's run by Peter Boyce, who's a, uh, if you don't know him, he's a big personality and a great, great guy. He was a senior uh, at the undergrad. Um, the treks I mentioned to New York, there's a Silicon Valley trek. Harvard Law students are providing free resources to startups. So if you need incorporation papers or contracts, 
or seed financing documents, go get some free resources over at the law school. And then this list of EIRs is ridiculous. I'm not going to go through each, each of these people, but I just will tell you that each of them are total superstars. And the fact that they give you their time for free and they show up on campus periodically and do office hours, you're crazy if you don't take advantage of it. And you should absolutely book two, three, four, five of them, look up their bios, figure out who fits your interests, who you think matches where you want to go, and absolutely um, get on their calendars. And if you can't get on their calendars because they say they're booked, complain to somebody. Because that's the whole point of the EIR program. Complain to Neil, right there. I saw you wave, Neil. Um, no, seriously, uh, the business school, the entrepreneurship, the Rock Center, this was an experiment three or four years ago. I was one of the first EIRs three or four years ago, and there were just a couple of us. And the demand was so great that now there's just an unbelievable roster. People on the East Coast and West Coast. David Hornick was here um, this week, he told me, right? Anybody meet with David from August Capital? Two people, three people met with David. Smart. David was the first blogging VC, by the way, um, and a spectacular guy. Um, and then uh, Eric Reese, who's, who's too busy to take office hours. He's the author of The Lean Startup. But we get him here periodically. He sits in on our class. Um, at uh, Launching Technology Ventures. We did when we did the fair here at the iLab, he participated in that. So again, another great resource for you to have access to. So that's the deal in a half hour about the Boston startup scene. Um, I'll, I'll stick around for a few minutes in a place. I'll go over there so I don't bother Raj. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you around campus. Thank you.